Hi, this is Ian Carroll from Stanford's Headache Clinic and Department of Anesthesiology. I'm here to do a, a, a Q&A for the uh, Spinal CSF Leak Foundation um, about intracranial hypotension and spinal fluid leaks that cause that. Um, my colleague is also here to help uh, ask me the questions that you guys post. Uh, her name is Dr. Meredith Barad, and she is uh, an assistant professor here in uh, the headache clinic and is board certified in headache medicine, pain medicine, and neurology. And so I'm going to introduce her really quickly. Come on over, Meredith, and say hi. Hello. I'm going to be sitting on the side, and I'm going to be feeding Ian some of your excellent questions. Okay. So, um, while we give people a couple of minutes to join us, um, let me share how I came to uh, my own mission uh, to help people with spinal fluid leaks. And it, uh, it kind of started for, um, it started for me with a personal experience from uh, my own family where uh, um, my daughter started having headaches and they were recurrent and severe and she was actually uh, hospitalized multiple times and we were getting to the point where we were talking about uh, maybe I would have to leave my job to take care of her and um, really in, in a dark hole that really only people who've been sick or had someone in their family be sick uh, can understand and after being in this kind of um, position really of despair uh, we got effective help part of what was going on with my daughter was a spinal fluid leak but really the thing about the experience uh, that brought me to this is understanding um, what a difference it can make in someone's life to really uh, help them get out of that position of despair and uh, one of the people who really helped us with that uh, by recognizing that it was headaches and what kind of treatment we would need uh, was Dr. Barad, who's here today, and so a uh, big thank you to her. And, uh, um, and so uh, this is kind of paying it forward, and um, it really, that experience got me thinking about uh, how finding those people who can be helped, uh, how important that is, and how those people will go on and help other people and um, we can make the world a better place that way. So again, while waiting for people to join us and start sending in comments, I do wanna talk about how what we've started to do here at Stanford in helping people with spinal fluid leaks has really been a team effort. And it's not been without uh, some controversy because um, having the courage to engage in uh, sometimes invasive diagnostic efforts and treatments in the absence of perfect information that what you're doing is in fact treating um, a spinal fluid leak. Sometimes you don't know when you start. Uh, it requires the courage to really help people and that's uh, been supported from the chair of anesthesia, Ron Pearl, who could have shut this down and said, look, this is, this is uh, too ambiguous to support, but instead decided to be supportive. Um, the neurology department and the director of headache medicine at neurology at Stanford, Rob Cowan, uh, Meredith, other headache faculty, um, and the autonomic faculty at Stanford in the autonomic clinic, uh, Mitch Miglis and Karen Friday, who runs a POTS clinic, have been hugely supportive. Pediatric pain at Stanford has started to get involved with this, and Elliot Crane and Genevieve D'Souza at pediatric pain management at Stanford have picked up this banner to treat the kids who have leaks. Um, and then the neuroradiologists at Stanford, who again had questions when we started getting a lot more CT myelograms about what was going on here. But the more they learned about it and read about it, the more supportive they became and really made this possible. And finally, uh, I'd like to thank my admin, Alyssa Martinez, who is um, here also with us and has made it possible to really uh, reach out to those people who started emailing us from around the country. So that having been said, uh, let me, uh, for those who are just joining us, reintroduce. I'm Ian Carroll from Stanford's Headache Clinic and Department of Anesthesiology. And we're here to answer your questions about spinal fluid leaks, 
uh, from the spine that causes intracranial hypotension. And uh, Meredith is here and she's going to start asking me some of your questions. So Meredith, why don't you go ahead? Okay, we have a couple questions coming in about imaging. And so I think the, the question would be, take us through your imaging process. Take us through how you, what you start with in terms of imaging, and if that is negative, what you go to next, and how that feels for the patient and what the patient goes through during those tests. Okay, so um, let me say that there's no proof that one imaging technique is in fact the best imaging technique. And there are three kinds of imaging techniques, and we have come to rely in different circumstances on all of them. So um, the imaging technique we all generally start with is uh, an MRI of the brain and the full spine. And recognize that while we get this in one event, an MRI, brain, and full spine, we're really looking for different things. Okay, so the underlying problem in the problem that we're talking about, the underlying problem in intracranial hypotension or spinal CSF fluid leaks, the underlying problem is a tear in the bag of fluid that surrounds the spinal cord and brain. That tear almost universally, not always, but almost universally happens in the spine, somewhere between the neck and the tailbone. And so when we do an MRI of the brain and the full spine, in the full spine, in the spine, we're looking for signs of fluid actually getting out of that bag. Um, sometimes we see the fluid leaking out. More commonly, we see um, not the leak itself, but the structure that is leaking. And those structures can either be a bone spur poking on the bag of fluid or what's called a perineural cyst but what is really a perineural cyst is a name that describes an aneurysm of the thecal sac, that bag of fluid. So a perineural cyst is in fact a bulbous ballooning dilation coming off the bag that like a balloon blows up and up and up and gets thinner and thinner until one day somebody coughs or they, um, or they fall or they hit the seatbelt in a little minor vehicle accident and a pressure wave goes through that bag of fluid and blows it out causing a spinal fluid leak. So we usually start with the MRI of the brain and the full spine. I've just told you why we're looking at the spine. What we're looking for in the brain is not a leak, but the consequences of the leak. So when you lose fluid from the spine, in the brain the pressure drops. And sometimes if the pressure drops enough, you will see uh, evidence of that on the MRI. And the evidence uh, is usually um, collections of blood or fluid over the top of the brain, what's called subdural hematomas or hygromas, um, uh, enlargement of the pituitary, enlargement of the veins, uh, enhancement, meaning brightness, of the, the covering of the, the brain, called the dura, and uh, sagging of the brain, which can mimic something called a Chiari, where you actually get the tonsils of the, of the cerebellum, the bottom part of the back of the brain, sagging down through the bottom of the skull. So um, it's not clear what percentage of people with leaks have positive imaging on the MRI. And the reason it's not clear is because to know that, you need to have some gold standard. You need to have a gold standard to say, okay, these people we know for sure have leaks, and this percentage of them had positive MRIs. And the truth is, is since there's no gold standard, it's hard to compare the MRI with something else and say, okay, there's this many people with leaks, and this percentage of them were positive on the MRI. Um, the studies that are out there, the case series that look at this, um, have said, okay, in the people who were brought to the OR, how many people with positive MRIs were in fact found to have a leak? Uh, but the truth is you don't bring the people to the OR to fix their leak when their imaging's negative. So um, anyhow, so we start with the MRI, even though we don't know just quite how good it really is. And we start with it not because we think necessarily it's the best test. We start with it because it's the least invasive test. It's the least dangerous test. And if it shows a leak, then we don't have to go and do other things to look for it. So we start with the MRI, and the patient experience during that is lying in a tight, round hole, which is the MRI machine, for about two or three hours. 
And uh, so it's a long time. Sometimes we'll give people relaxation medicine to help them with it. They're awake because it's important for them to stay still. But if you haven't had an MRI, it's like lying in a little bit of a claustrophobic bed while someone beats a drum next to your head. Bang, 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 bang. And um, <laughs> it's a little bit of a trip. So um, that's where we start. We use the MRI not to rule out a leak, i.e. we don't say a negative MRI means there's no leak. We use a positive MRI to rule in a leak, which is in medical terms, what we say is we're pretty sure that it is specific. If we see the signs there, we know there's a leak. We're not sure if it's sensitive. Uh, if we don't see a leak, we don't know if that means there's none there. Um, and the research hasn't really, in my opinion, adequately addressed that. So uh, if the MRI is negative, but someone has a good story for a leak, they have headaches that tend to be worse late in the day or when they first get up, um, they have ringing in the ears, they have nausea, uh, they have neurocognitive concerns, difficulty with memory, concentration, but their MRI is negative, we go forward with the next test, which is typically, a, for us, a CT myelogram, which involves uh, a needle stuck in the bag of fluid down low in the back, an injection of contrast into that fluid. It's allowed to spread around, and then we get a CT scan. So um, from the patient perspective, what does this look like? From the patient perspective, it's more invasive. There's a needle in the back. That needle is put in here for all the prone on a fluoride. Table. And so if people feel vulnerable, that can be increasing early. You're half naked, you're lying face down on an x-ray table while some stranger is sticking a needle in your back. Um, the discomfort of having the needle in the back can uh, be anything from hardly discomfortable at all to some patients, you know, find it quite uncomfortable. And the needle gets put in, the contrast gets injected. At the same time we're injecting the contrast, we measure the pressure in the spinal fluid fluid. Again, we see that as specific, but not necessarily sensitive. If the pressure is non-existent or is very low, there's a good chance there's a leak. If the pressure's higher, maybe there's still a leak that's being compensated for, or maybe there's not a leak. Um, the other thing we do is we send that spinal fluid to the lab, and maybe 50, 60 percent of the people who we have been looking at this way uh, have elevated spinal fluid, and that tells us that there's really something here medical to be found. It may not be a leak, but there's something here to be found and to be gone after hard because your spinal fluid protein should not be elevated. Um, and you wouldn't believe how many people I've been told have somatoform disorders or their, their syndromes are coming from some form of psychological distress. And the truth is the moment you find that elevated spinal fluid pressure, or excuse me, spinal fluid protein, this isn't something that's being caused by rough life circumstances, you know, it gets everybody, meaning not just Dr. Carroll or the people who are focused on leaks at Stanford, everybody starts to get on the same page. There's something biologic here that can be found that's important and is treatable. Um, so after they stick the needle in, they inject the fluid, they tilt you kind of head down for anywhere 30 minutes to 60 minutes to let the, the contrast spread in the spinal fluid and then they put you in something that looks like an MRI, but from your point of view is really different. The CT scan takes all of two or three minutes, and it gives very high resolution images, uh, images that in many ways are much better than the MRI image. Uh, exquisite sensitivity to looking for calcium or bone spurs poking at the bag of fluid where a sharp edge can be on the, bone, the, the bag of fluid. Um, and uh, a very detailed look at the margin and borders of the bag of fluid, just every 0.6 centimeters. So um, really in many ways superior to the MRI images. Now, I will tell you that world-class experts on leaks disagree on this. Some will say that the MRI is better. Some will say the CT myelogram is better. I've had at least one say his go-to test is the radionuclide cisternogram, which we'll talk about next. But this is what we do here at Stanford, and that's why. Um, for people who are allergic to contrast, we'll start with the radionuclide cisternography, which involves, instead of injecting contrast, some radioactive material and looking to see where that spreads. But let's take another question. 
I think we should get to the sister pornography because that's a that was a question. But okay. um, one other question, Karina asks, um, if you are investigating a patient who has a Chiari, is it safe to perform a lumbar puncture or a myelogram? Okay, so um, if we're investigating someone who has the question from Karina is, if somebody has some tonsillar descent, i.e., they have the picture of what looks like a Chiari, is it safe to do? Uh, a lumbar puncture? And the answer is, um, we're not sure that it's totally without risk. However, a small needle poke in the bag of fluid, if the sagging is small, we think is safe. There are degrees of sagging that are so extreme that we worry about that, and we'll consult the neurosurgeon first and have them weigh in with, do they think it's in fact safe? We have had some people who have Chiari-like pictures on their MRI who we do a CT myelogram on, and instead of drawing off a lot of spinal fluid, sometimes we won't even send the spinal fluid to the lab to minimize that risk. And in addition, if we think that there really is elevated risk of this, which isn't inconceivable, and we've had people who've declined CT myelograms because of this, although we've never had a problem with someone actually being hurt by this, um, if, in fact, there is a lot of concern, we can, we can arrange that we will patch the hole from the myelogram immediately. So if there's a big concern with a Chiari, you can do the CT myelogram, and instead of bringing someone, instead of sending someone home to go walk around with a new little leak in the bag of fluid, you can bring them right to the OR or bring them to the OR that day and go ahead and uh, patch them there immediately. Um, should we get back to this radionuclide cisternogram, or do you think we should take more questions? Well, well, maybe we can combine them. Um, we have one patient um, who asked sorry, let me find that really quick, um, about leaking from clear fluid leaking from her nose and, and ear, um, and is that a sign of a leak, and how would that leak be found in this area? Okay, so uh, the question is about, and I'm glad this was asked, uh, the question was about clear fluid leaking from the nose and ear, and does that mean that somebody has a leak, and does it mean that the leak is, for instance, from the skull rather than from, um, from the spine? And uh, before I answer that, let me, let me just, for an introduction for people who are coming late, say that we're here doing uh, a live Q&A on Facebook for the Spinal CSF Leak Foundation. I'm Dr. Ian Carroll, joined by Meredith Barad. Uh, and the question is about what does it mean when someone has symptoms and has clear fluid running out their nose and running out their ear? And how might a radionuclide cisternogram possibly contribute to the knowledge of that? So the answer is this. Um, it is clear that spinal fluid can leak either from the bag of fluid surrounding the spine or from the skull base. There are well-documented cases of people leaking from both sides. What is less clear is, does fluid leaking from the skull base result in the clinical syndrome that people uh, call orthostatic hypotension or intracranial hypotension? So um, it is not clear if a skull base leak will cause headaches that are worse when you're upright, better when you're flat, the ringing in the ears, um, the nausea, uh, the fatigue, the concentration problems. It's not clear if a cranial leak does that. And the reason it's not clear is because the fluid that's up in the skull is really not under a lot of pressure. And so if you have a leak up there, you tend not to lose large volumes of fluid. And in contrast, the bag of fluid where we stick a needle in down low in the back that's in continuity with that whole bag all the way up to the head the fluid down low in the bag is under a lot of pressure, just like when you dive to the bottom of a pool to pick something up, you feel much more pressure at the bottom. Uh, and so a small leak down there is gonna cause a lot of fluid to leak out fast. And so experts in the field, Mokri, uh, Shevink, um, have argued that, uh, that fluid coming out of the skull base uh, does not cause that clinical syndrome, that there is not in all of the medical literature one clear case where that is true, and that in the cases where it seems like that is true, uh, where someone just had skull surgery and they have fluid coming out their nose and uh, they're having this kind of headache that's worse when they're upright, 
when those people have been carefully investigated, they've all been found to have leaks down in their spine. Um, so even when the story seems to overwhelmingly indicate a skull-based leak, usually if the clinical symptoms sound like a leak, you should be looking down in the spine. Um, now, how can you tell if, inf and I will tell you, I've seen multiple, multiple patients who have copious amounts of fluid pouring out their nose or their ear, and you patch their spine leak, and in fact, it goes away. So there's got to be some kind of reflex where the leaking spinal fluid causing traction on the brain stem and the cranial nerves activates those reflexes that get activated, for instance, when you're sneezing, to make you produce copious amounts of fluid to help clear your sinuses. Um, and in fact, when you patch them, the fluid stops, when you patch them down in their spine, the fluid stops pouring out their nose. There's two tests really that you can do, three tests you can do to go looking for a skull-based leak. Uh, because when you're the patient who's experiencing copious amounts of fluid pouring out your nose, no matter how many times I've explained this, it's really hard for people to let go of the idea that they have a skull-based leak. So there's three tests that really we do. One is we can continue the CT myelogram all the way up to the skull base. Again, CT scans are exquisitely sensitive to bone fractures. Very good way to look for bone fractures. And if you let the contrast from the myelogram raise up, rise all the way up to the skull base and then do a CT scan, it's a good way of looking for a leak. So that's one way to look. Second way to look is to collect some of that spinal fluid and you send it off to the Mayo Clinic and they test it for a protein called beta-2 transferrin. That protein only occurs in the spinal fluid. If you collect enough of that fluid and there's no beta-2 transferrin in it, then it's not spinal fluid. Um, and the third way to do it is when you do a radionuclide cisternogram, which is like an, a CT myelogram, except instead of injecting CT contrast, they, radi they inject a, a, a radioactive substance into the spinal fluid. It has about as much radioactivity as a CT scan. Um, they let it diffuse through the spinal fluid, and they can do what's called a pledget study, which is you ask your ear, nose, and throat expert colleagues to put some pledgets up each nostril, and they leave them in there for the three days after they do the, um, the radionuclide cisterna cisternogram. And uh, at the end of it, you take out those pledgets and you look at them with a Geiger counter, and if there's no radioactivity, then the fluid pouring out your nose wasn't, um, wasn't spinal fluid. So there's ways of looking for this, but, um, but as far as we're able to understand, we all think that, in fact, fluid pouring out your nose and ear, if it is spinal fluid, it doesn't cause that syndrome. It doesn't cause you to have chronic headaches that are worse when you're upright with ringing in the ears, um, and that the real opportunity for helping here is to go looking for the leak down in the spine that's often driving this. Uh, next question. Okay, we have some questions about uh, post-patching pressure changes. Okay. And how long should patients, in your experience, ex expect to feel rebound hypertension after a patch? So, um, there's, here's, so the question is, about pressure changes in the spinal fluid that occur after patching. And um, the, uh, so let me give some background to this and then tell you what our thoughts are about this. Number one, when somebody's been leaking for a long time and you patch them, it has been observed by us and others and written about, but not extensively in the literature, that some people then develop a problem called rebound intracranial hypertension, where uh, instead of having low pressure, once you fix the leak, people start having high pressure. We don't know if the underlying cause of this is that when somebody is leaking, they start overproducing spinal fluid, and then when you patch them, their brain's not able to stop that. Or if alternatively, the normal mechanism in someone who's not leaking for resorbing spinal fluid that's produced somehow get shut off when people are leaking and it can't be turned back on. Um, in either case, it's clear that uh, some people who have been patched after long leaking can then develop elevated high pressures and that can cause its own set of symptoms. Um, the papers that are written out there suggest that this is generally a benign and temporary problem. 
um, resolving over weeks to months. We have seen that we've seen a couple of things. Number one, when you use fibrin glue, um, fibrin glue, which is purified clotting factors from blood donors, um, appears to be much more effective at sealing leaks permanently uh, because the clot it forms uh, clots faster, it, uh, it becomes stronger, and it's more durable, lasting longer. Um, that the fibrin glue, when we use it, we see more of this rebound intracranial hypertension. The second thing is, is that um, we have seen a number of people who appear to have, without diminishment, uh, rebound intracranial hypertension that's lasting months and months without any sign that it's about to go away. And so I'm not convinced that for everyone that this is a temporary thing. Uh, I am unfamiliar with papers talking about uh, this being simply a permanent thing and what percentage of people can suspect this as a permanent thing. Our experience is that we run into this much less as a problem when we use blood, but that conversely, when we use blood, often we have to patch and patch and patch and patch. Um, and that people will often seal temporarily and then break through again. And so we wind up with this trade-off of trying to seal the underlying problem, which seems much more effective with uh, the glue, but in fact uh, is associated with more durable problems with rebound intracranial hypertension. In terms of treating the rebound intracranial hypertension, uh, most doctors are familiar with using Diamox. We typically start people, through our experience with our patients, we found that the extended release Diamox seems to work better than the immediate release, maybe because it's consistently at kind of therapeutic blood levels. And so my practice has been to start people on 500 milligrams twice a day of the Diamox. The other name for that is acetazolamide. This is a, a drug that was developed as a diuretic to cause you to, to uh, urinate more sodium and fluid, but it appears that the same proteins that are involved in your kidneys in helping you control fluid and sodium and regulate how much of it goes from your blood into your urine, that these same proteins are up in your brain regulating how much of the fluid from your blood turns into spinal fluid. And so we find a lot of diuretics that cause you to, um, to make more urine actually cause you to make less spinal fluid. And so the Diamox is a diuretic, causes you to make less spinal fluid. We start 500 milligrams twice a day of the extended release. If people aren't responding to that, we go up to 1,000 milligrams twice a day. If they're not responding to that, it seems like Lasix, furosemide, is the most effective drug at bringing down pressure, brings down pressure for a lot of people. But um, when you add Lasix, furosemide to the Diamox, not only do you control the pressure in the head really well, but you cause people to pee out very large amounts of potassium, and then you're chasing the potassium by giving people a lot of oral potassium, and some people get nauseated with the oral potassium, and it can be hard to keep up with the potassium loss. So then we gotta give yet a third medication to cause the potassium not to spill out so rapidly, and there are several diuretics that seem helpful for reducing pressure, but also uh, cause you not to spill potassium. Uh, one spironolactone, another's a milleride, um, but then we'll, we will add those in for people who need to be on the Diamox and the uh, furosemide and are losing a lot of potassium. Um, more questions? Yes, there are lots of questions. Um, how many patches typically until you use fibrin glue? And does fibrin glue ever dissolve or is it permanently there? We should noted it on her myelogram following her, her, uh, her injection with fibrin glue. It was noted on her myelogram. Okay, so the question is how many blood patches do you do before you start using fibrin glue? And is the fibrin glue there permanently? Um, let me start with uh, the, is the fibrin there, glue there permanently? We think the fibrin glue, the fibrin glue is made from, in fact, clotting proteins, the same clotting proteins that are in your blood, but that have been purified and concentrated from blood, do blood donors. So our understanding is that the ultimate disposition of that should be the same as the ultimate disposition of clot when we inject your blood. And that is, is that little by little, your body should clean that up and get rid of it. How quickly that ultimately disappears, um, uh, whether it's uh, less than two weeks, and what percentage of people it happens in less than two weeks, and what percentage of people it happens in less than two months, 
Uh, I can't give you a, a, an easy answer to that. My understanding from doing some repeat imaging on people is that like you, we often will see some evidence of prior uh, patches. Usually the amount of plot that we still see on subsequent imaging when the imaging is done more than a month after the, uh, the last injection is very small. So we'll see small areas where it looks like there's some residual clot, but almost all of the blood or the glue is gone after a month when we've done our repeat imaging. Um, the other part of that question was, when do we switch from using blood to glue? So I've told you that the glue, in fact, uh, seals better. Uh, it seems more durable. We stop more people's leaks, and it seems we stop more people's leaks permanently when we use the glue. Um, but I've told you that one drawback from the glue is that we see a higher incidence of this rebound intracranial hypertension, and we see the, another drawback from it is that it turns into clot. And clot inside your body doesn't look like clot on a scab on your skin that's kind of hard. Clot in your body is more like, uh, because it doesn't become dehydrated, it's, it has a consistency of kind of jello. Um, and because the fibrin glue turns into this jello within 10 seconds, it's starting to turn into the jello, it doesn't spread very well. And so we won't use fibrin glue unless we have a really good idea of the leak is here. Um, whereas when we, and so we'll use two or three cc's of the glue because it doesn't spread very far and we don't want to put so much in one spot that it pushes on the spinal cord and damages it. Um, whereas when we use the blood, it spreads very well. So we'll often put in 15 or 20 uh, cc's. So anywhere from, um, from five to 10 to eight times as much volume when we're using blood because it spreads up and down, which means if I'm wrong about where the leak is, I have a much better chance of still helping you if I'm using blood. Uh, and blood is the more accepted uh, thing that's written about in the literature. And so usually, almost universally, we start by giving somebody a blood patch and we make them uh, show us that that's not gonna be good enough for them before we move on to fiber and glue. Uh, I find over time I'm using fibrin glue earlier in the process because it seems to in fact be so effective for many people. Now, imagine you're a doctor and you're working in a hospital and you're treating people with spinal fluid leaks and you're trying to treat people whose imaging is ambiguous, okay? People, your colleagues, are going to be accepting if there's a good clinical story that somebody's leaking and the imaging is ambiguous, they're going to be reasonable about saying, well, why don't you go ahead and try and treat them if the treatment isn't that dangerous, try and treat them and see how they do. Um, and so people will generally, my colleagues will generally think, look, it's okay to go ahead and do a blood patch on someone who has a good story, who has predisposing factors, but whose imaging is either negative or ambiguous. What's not okay is if they're not getting better to keep on patching them. And so at Stanford, we've kind of through consensus with our colleagues, we've decided three patches is enough for someone who has negative or ambiguous imaging. And if you're not seeing progress by three patches, you can't just go on and do six or nine, or you can't do indefinite patches on someone who doesn't have obvious evidence of a leak and um, who's not getting better. And so uh, since we think we really have three bites at the apple, what we want to do is we want to make those bites count. We want to be getting progress. And so uh, we start with blood. If after one blood patch we're not seeing anything, but we think we've got a good thing to focus on, we'll put glue there. If we're not sure where we should be focusing on, we might give them a second blood patch before we move on to glue. If you're still not getting better, I'm trying to put the glue somewhere to make sure that we get some response before we're through our three patches. It's a little easier if someone has obvious imaging evidence. Nobody's gonna say you should stop treating someone who has a good story and the obvious imaging evidence of a leak. But when somebody's imaging evidence of a leak is minor or ambiguous, what we see is, is that the literature's quiet on this. Many doctors feel uncomfortable about treating at all. And um, the doctors that feel comfortable with saying, hey, you can make such a big difference in these people's lives if they are leaking and you find it, that even when the imaging's negative, it may be worth trying to patch them, but you can't patch them indefinitely. 
all right? And so at Stanford, our, the magic arbitrary number is three. And so we're trying to get progress there, and that may cause us to use the fiber and glue a little earlier. Uh, next question. Okay, the next question is, um, uh, let's talk about your experience with other associations with leaks. People have asked about dementia and leaks. People have asked about deafness and leaks. And people mm -hmm. have asked about Meniere's and leaks. Do you, have you seen any associations? Um, so the question is, associated conditions with leaks, dementia, um, Meniere's, which is a condition that causes chronic dizziness, and uh, Meniere's dementia, and what was the other one? Um, uh, deafness. Oh, and deafness. So um, we ask uh, every person who we evaluate for a leak about dizziness. We ask every person we evaluate about um, hearing changes. And uh, I have not yet seen someone who is totally deaf from a spinal fluid leak, to my knowledge. Um, but I don't see a lot of deaf people. I will say this, that when we ask people who have good stories for a leak, and many of whom are fixed with a patch, or who have obvious evidence of a leak on imaging, uh, the percentage of people who describe changes in their hearing is very high. Um, I was talking to someone yesterday who was telling me that the hearing in his left ear is intermittently reduced from, uh, from his leak, and the thing that kind of made him realize he was having hearing changes is he kept uh, trying to replace his headphones because it seemed like his headphones, when he was listening to his music, kept dropping out in his left ear. Uh, but it, it didn't matter how new the headphones were. Every time you buy a new pair of headphones, you have the same problem. He finally realized that he was having this, this hearing change in his left ear, and not only that, it was intermittent. Um, so the hearing changes are very common. Uh, I haven't actually seen full-on deafness bilaterally. Um, and a number of people who have reported us, reported to us the subjective sense that their hearing has changed, when they go on and get hearing tests, they actually have hearing loss. So it's not just in their head, they're actually, in fact, experiencing hearing loss. Uh, with regard to um, uh, Meniere's, what we see is uh, Meniere's, so let me tell you this, A, I'm not an ENT doctor, I'm not an ear, nose, and throat doctor, I'm not an expert in Meniere's. I don't pretend to be an expert in Meniere's. But what I have seen is that many people with chronic dizziness uh, get diagnosed with Meniere's. And it may be that, in fact, some of them are getting diagnosed with it as kind of a, uh, a final common pathway. You look for all the things that you can fix, and if you can't find anything and there's, they have persistent dizziness without another explanation, they get diagnosed with Meniere's. And so um, what I would say is, is if you've been diagnosed with Meniere's, but you also feel bad, you feel badly when you stand up and you have ringing in the ears and you have chronic nausea and you have the other symptoms, and especially if you're someone whose connective tissue is more prone to having a leak, so you're abnormally flexible, you're abnormally tall, you have a scoliosis, you have a history of a pneumothorax, you have a history of what's called a pectus ex excavatum with your ribs bending in, uh, or someone in your family's like this, abnormally tall, abnormally short, um, and you've got quote-unquote Meniere's because you've got chronic dizziness, there is a chance that your chronic dizziness is really because you're leaking and not because of some secondary process. Um, tomorrow, uh, the Spinal CSF Leak Foundation is going to have another webinar with a neurosurgeon from Cedar sinai named Wouter Schievink, who's a, a really kind of the reigning world expert on spinal fluid leaks, who's written multiple papers about people with this, what's called frontotemporal dementia, where they get diagnosed with dementia when their real problem is a spinal fluid leak. And their neurologic status can be improved by being patched. And, um, you know, it's one reason why if you've got a parent who's got dementia, um, they should have imaging. And if they're complaining not only of dementia, but ringing in the ears, chronic nausea, you know, really hard look should be given for a leak. Um, there's so many causes of dementia. Maybe half a percent of dementia might be due to leaks. Who the hell? Nobody really knows. So you'd be looking for dementia in the context of a good story, which would mean some kind of trauma maybe uh, that preceded the onset. Um, you'd be looking for it happening in someone who has... Uh, who either themselves was abnormally flexible, abnormally tall, or abnormally short, 
who has some evidence of their connective tissue being not quite right, and um, who has the associated symptoms, chronic unexplained nausea, maybe they're getting diagnosed with uh, irritable bowel or gastroparesis, um, and they're also, maybe they're getting diagnosed with a Chiari because their cerebellar tonsils are low, or they're getting diagnosed with POTS because they feel bad every time they stand up. Um, so you're really looking for the constellation, and if that constellation is right, don't let a negative MRI make you totally drop it all together. Um, I think this would be a good question for Dr. Shevink to address. Uh, and the truth is there might be so much underlying dementia that unless you have obvious ne uh, neuroimaging findings on MRI, you just can't pursue a leak in the people who are demented. Um, next question. A uh, couple questions on pregnancy. Is it safe to be treated for a leak during pregnancy? Is it safe to conceive if you're a known leaker? Uh, is it safe to conceive? Un an untreated leak situation. Okay, so the question is about pregnancy, and the question is, uh, is it safe to conceive if you have a leak? Is it safe to manage a leak when you're pregnant? Um, there's very, very little written about this. Um, I've discussed this somewhat with my wife, who happens to be a high-risk obstetrician. Little shout out to Bonnie Dwyer at Palo Alto Medical Foundation. Um, but I'll give you my only personal experience with this. Uh, we treated uh, a young woman who, in fact, um, uh, had started her family um, with uh, some blood patches. She got much better. She had been really doing very badly, had some brain sag, and um, we treated her with blood patches. She got markedly better, but not fixed. And, uh, and then she moved out of the area, um, and the next text I got about her was from Dr. Shevink saying, Ian, why didn't you tell this woman, don't get pregnant? Um, because she had gotten pregnant and wound up uh, being treated by Dr. Shevink. And the truth is, is um, we cover so much in our visits. I'm not sure that I had thought to tell her to, to comment one way or another on you should get pregnant or you shouldn't get pregnant or what, what precautions you should take. And here's what I'll say. If you're someone who has Ehlers-Danlos and you may have a leak or recurrent leaks, you can't put the best things in life on hold forever. Um, you have a discussion with a knowledgeable maternal fetal medicine doctor about the risks, benefits, and alternatives of proceeding with, uh, with a pregnancy and what that might mean for you, just the way someone with lupus has that conversation or someone with heart failure has that conversation with their OB. Just because you have a sickness doesn't mean you don't get to have kids but it does mean that you need expert help and uh, you should know what you're getting into and what the issues are. And there may be things that the OBs can do to make it safer for you. Um, pushing to deliver might not be the best idea if you had a recurrent leak or you've just recently been patched. You might blow out that patch by trying to hold your breath and push as hard as you can. Uh, and so having an assisted delivery or a C-section might actually go better. Um, Evaluating a leak when somebody's pregnant is really challenging because you can't do things with radiation and uh, or you can only do things with very limited radiation. Uh, so you're stuck with the MRI. Um, doing x-ray guided procedures like patches is very limited. Uh, but again, not totally impossible. The general teaching in pregnancy is, is that pregnant people can safely experience one CT, um, which is a lot of x-rays. Uh, compared to, for instance, the x-rays that are used to do a fluoroscopically guided procedure. So if you are leaking and you, uh, um, you're thinking of getting pregnant, you should talk to a maternal fetal medicine doctor, not just a regular OB, and you need to go to a good one. And don't expect them to know anything about leaks to start, but if they're really good, what they'll do is they'll read. And they'll say, listen, I'm going I'm I'm to need to investigate this, and I'm going to get back to you, and I'm going to talk to my neurosurgery colleagues or my neurology colleagues. There isn't anybody who's so good at maternal fetal medicine that they're going to know the kind of things that you know after watching these kinds of webinars. It's just, it's not that common. It's not that read about. It doesn't mean they're a bad doctor. Um, next question. A lot of questions about POTS. Okay. And your thoughts about the, the relationship between POTS and leaks. Okay, so a lot of questions about POTS 
and spinal fluid leaks and their relationship and my thoughts on this. And so let me preface this by saying that I, I may on this issue be outside the, the medical mainstream, and I'll tell you why. Okay, so um, after my daughter had the experience that I talked about at the beginning of this talk, um, I did an insane amount of reading about spinal fluid leaks, uh, read everything I could find, talked about it with everyone I could have an intelligent conversation with, and then, very shortly thereafter, there was um, something in the New York Times in the Be Well section um, that was about a patient with POTS. Um, and it was titled, Swept Off Her Feet. And it was written by someone named Lisa Sanders. And uh, it sounded just like a spinal fluid leak to me. It was someone who'd been in a car accident, started having headaches that were worse when they were upright. They started having dizziness. They had a history that suggested a connective tissue problem because they were a young woman who nonetheless had spinal surgery and temporomandibular joint problems and scoliosis, um, all of which kind of suggest in a young woman that there was something not right about her connective tissue. And, uh, and then she started having dizziness and fainting when she stood up. And she went to uh, Massachusetts General Hospital where they didn't do a lumbar puncture because she had previously had the spine surgery. And um, they noted that her heart went up when she was upright. Her heart rate went up when she was upright, and they diagnosed her with POTS, which is this, it's an acronym for Postural Orthostatic Tachycardia Syndrome. Uh, a syndrome, which means we don't really know what causes it, but a clinical constellation of findings that we find in people again and again, where there is a group of people who, when they stand upright, um, they feel bad, they get dizzy. Um, the longer they're upright, the worse they feel. They often get elevated heart rate, and um, they can really be debilitated by this. And I thought this woman had a spinal fluid leak. So you know what I did? I called my colleague, Dr. Barad, sitting over there, and I said, doesn't this sound like a much better thing for a spinal fluid leak, especially with the connective tissue stuff that they describe? And she said, well, you know, Ian, uh, Ehlers-Danlos, this connective tissue problem, is also associated with POTS. And that really blew me away because there's really only two conditions that make people feel terrible when they're upright. One is a spinal fluid leak, which we understand and can fix. And one is POTS, which is mysterious. No one knows really what to do well for it to make people better. And the fact that they should both be associated with connective tissue problems I thought, at the very minimum, presented a lot of opportunity for misdiagnosis, especially since I've seen a number of people in my job as a pain medicine practitioner at Stanford, I've seen a number of people who we've caused leaks on by sticking them with needles, either when we're doing an epidural or we're putting in a spinal cord stimulator. And you know what? When we cause a leak, a lot of times it causes tachycardia. And so... Um, I got in my head that really this might be a real thing where diagnosis could be confused, and so I started calling the POTS clinics at Stanford. It turns out there's two, one in cardiology and one in neurology, and saying, hey, look, if you see somebody who's got POTS and they're worse when they're standing up, and especially if they're hyperflexible or have other signs of connective tissue problems, and headache is a big part of their diagnosis, I want you to send them over and we'll evaluate them for whether they have a leak. And I'll tell you, we started finding people who met every criteria for POTS, positive tilt table tests, but who had headache as a big part of it. And when we patch them, they get better. And not only do their headaches get better, but sometimes their tachycardia gets better, which has the people, myself included here at Stanford, saying, what in the world is going on here? Is this really misdiagnosis or, and this is where I'm way outside the medical mainstream, is it possible that for some people with POTS, the spinal fluid leak actually causes the POTS? That POTS is a syndrome, a way of presenting with spinal fluid leaks. And that is an unknown, we don't know. Uh, the only thing I can tell you is there have been some people who have been diagnosed with POTS, who we have patched, who have told us that they are better not only in terms of their head pain, but their tachycardia. I don't know what that means. I don't know if it means that they had both. I don't know if it means they've been misdiagnosed or if it means, most intriguingly, that POTS might, in some people, be caused by a spinal fluid leak, but there it is. Meredith, did I explain that well? Excellent. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, okay, maybe a few more quick questions. What is the typical volume of blood you use for a patch? Um, when we patch, again, because we only have three bites at the apple, only have three opportunities to bring them in and patch them if the imaging isn't uh, a slam dunk, um, we're going after anything that looks suspicious. And so uh, I will put, when we're patching, a needle into more than one location. Uh, if I see two things that are suspicious, I'll put in two needles to make sure I get blood there. If I see three things that are suspicious, I'll put in up to three needles. I generally don't put in more than three needles, but I'm willing to patch three different spots when they come in for one epidural patch. Um, when they come in for that patch, give me the question again, Meredith. What's the volume typical? Oh, I guess the total volume. Um, I won't give a total volume of more than 45 cc's. Uh, and so if I put three needles in, they won't get more than 15 at each needle. Um, often I'll give more like 30 cc's, but I, I'm, if somebody is, when we're giving the blood, I have the patient awake, I'm talking to them. If they say they're not feeling too much pressure in their head or in their ears, then I have no problem giving them up to 40 or 45 cc's. I don't give them more. We've had a number of patients who, when we start getting up to 40 or 45, they say that their head feels really full, their ears feel really full. And um, uh, and the next thing that happens if you keep plunging blood in there is some of them actually pass out. Um, and so we take that seriously when we're talking to them and they say, I'm starting to feel pressure in my head, we stop. Uh, pressure in the back, pressure wrapping, you know, going down the leg or down the arm, that's pretty common. That's not a reason necessarily for stopping in our view. Um, people who have profound leaks and are really volume depleted in their bag of fluid may readily tolerate more than 45 cc's. We don't do that. Uh, they were doing it at some point down at Cedar sinai giving up to 100 cc's. There are papers talking about how that's been done safely and effectively for some people. It's pretty outside the mainstream. Uh, if you're at a center where there are experts who are doing this recurrently uh, and everything else has failed, it's not a crazy thing to talk about or consider and talk about what are the risks and the benefits. Here at Stanford, we don't go over 45. I don't go over 45. I haven't gone over 45. Uh, I haven't had the compelling case where I thought that the right thing to do was to give more than that. I'm not saying it's wrong if somebody else does it in some extraordinary circumstance. Uh, we've got to keep seeing what are the things that can be done to help people who aren't getting better with anything else. If a patient is flying in to have a procedure, how long do you like them to hang around in Palo Alto? Okay, so the question is, if someone's flying in for a procedure to have a blood patch, how long do I like to have them in the area? Um, let me say, the ideal circumstance is you just move to Palo Alto forever so that I can take care of you if there's a problem. But I recognize that that ideal circumstance is unreasonable. Uh, and so really what we wind up doing is we compromise between what's desirable for me and what's reasonable for you. Um, I will tell you that I strongly recommend that after being patched that people stay flat for three days. There is no data that three days results in better outcome than two days, or that two days results in better outcome than one day. There is data that when you're using blood, that laying flat for two hours is better than one hour. Um, and so the question is, if you're a doctor and it's really hard to get people into the OR, and you're putting a ton of effort into doing something that is potentially risky and definitely invasive like a patch, you want to give it the best chance of working. And when that's the case, how long do you tell someone to be flat? So three days is what we've arrived at. Um, Dr. Shevink, who's again giving a talk here starting at 11 tomorrow, um, will tell you that he gives people different advice. We tell people, I want you flat for three days, and um, after that, uh, you might not feel like getting right on a plane the very next day, but typically two or three days later, you can get on a plane and head home. What about activity or exercise after a patch? Okay, so activity or exercise after, after those a patch. Three days and you go All right. Home. Uh, I tell people that, um, again, the literature's silent on this. Uh, I tell people that for the first six weeks, uh, no heavy lifting and no stretching, no going to the gym, nothing heavier than a gallon of milk for the first six weeks. Um, and, uh, but normal activities of daily living are permissible. You get up, you start walking around, you don't wanna be on your back for too long. 
Uh, Meredith and I have discussed, like, you know, how long can you tell someone to be flat on their back before you find that you cause at least one person to get a blood clot because you told them to lie flat on their back, meaning a, a clot in their legs, what's called a, uh, a deep venous thrombosis, and, which can put you at risk of something called the pulmonary embolism. So uh, not good to be flat on your back forever, and... Um, we want, uh, we want people to be flat on their back for three days, but then we want them up and moving around so that they don't get things like clots. All right, how do people refer, how do people come to see you, Dr. Carroll? Um, at this point, the best way is to, um, things are in flux here at Stanford a little bit in terms of where I'm seeing people. Historically, I saw people in the pain clinic at Stanford. I'm going to be seeing people going forward for leaks in the neurology headache clinic. Uh, and so things are a little bit in flux. At this point, the best way to find out who you should contact is to email my administrative assistant, Alyssa Martinez, and her email, let me make sure I get this right, is A-M-A-R-T, number 10, at stanford.edu. Is that right, Alyssa? Yes. All right, so I'm going to say that again, A-M-A-R-T, so A, Alyssa Martinez, M-A-R-T, A-M-A-R-T, at stanford.edu, and she'll help guide you in the right direction, and uh, otherwise, what I would do is I would Google um, Stanford, headache, uh, Stanford Headache Clinic, new patient referral, and we'll make sure that that, that takes you to the right spot going forward. Other questions? I think we're probably close to our time. What time is it now? 11.57. All right, so I think uh, we were supposed to go for a half hour. It's now been 57 minutes. Um, thank you very much. I want to remind all of you uh, that there are lots of resources on the Spinal CSF Leak Foundation website that this is Leak Week. And tomorrow, Wouter Schievink, one of my heroes, uh, neurosurgeon, world-class expert on leaks at Cedar sinai Medical Center is going to be live on Facebook, right here, answering your questions. So thank you very much.